Okay. Um, okay. I think I should be recording. So uh, thanks, Hope, for that uh, very, very um, uh, 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 over the top, <laughs> top introduction. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get my presentation started. Um, and uh, can you see it okay, Hope? Yep. Yeah, it looks all good. All right, Look. fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the the title of my presentation is Good for a Pet or Good on the Grill, The Terrible Truths of Backyard Chickens. Um, and uh, that title, the quote, is actually from an, from an actual um, posting about uh, someone who was trying to get rid of a, an unwanted chicken. And I, I'm kind of nervous to follow Kay, the amazing Karen Davis for, for my presentation directly, but she actually uh, really uh, made a good uh, segue point into my presentation because I'm going to be talking about a lot of the things that she ended uh, her presentation on. Um, so uh, I do want to start, um, oops, I do want to start uh, my presentation with a story. Um, this is a story about a hen named Bibi. Many of you know Bibi and have heard of Bibi before. Um, and if you've already heard the story, then you get to hear it again because Bibi's amazing. So I'm going to talk about it all the time. Um, but BB was uh, hatched um, as a group of uh, 12, uh, 12 eggs that were hatched by a, a small um, here near us in North Carolina. It's a very common thing, a hatching project. Um, UPC actually has a great resource um, for people who want to try to help steer schools away from doing hatching projects. Um, but BB was hatched by the students at this small school. Um, out of the 12, eight of them ended up being roosters and were sent back to the farm where the eggs were, were purchased from, and you can imagine what happened to them there. And then uh, Bibi and her three other sisters were living at the school in a little uh, enclosure called, we call it a chicken tractor. It's um, very, they're very inexpensive and they're not safe at all. Well, uh, one night um, a raccoon broke into the chicken tractor where Bibi and her sisters were living and um, proceeded to kill three of the hens and then was in the process of killing Bibi when the woman who lived there heard the ruckus and ran out and scared the raccoon off. Um, and so as you can see there, uh, Bibi's beak has been uh, broken at the tip. Um, and there's also a crack on the bottom part of it. And then also her waddles have been torn and she just looks shell shocked. Um, we picked her up, um, you know, uh, days after this event happened when they, they contacted us about her. This was back in 2014. Um, and so, uh, she was traumatized, both physically and, and, and emotionally. She had just lost her three sisters, um, you know, her only companions. And so she was living in the people's backyard. And the reason that they contacted us was because they were saying that she would just kind of stand outside their, their, on their back, in their backyard next to the, their sliding glass door all day. And then at night, she refused to go back into the chicken tractor and would sleep up in a tree. Um, and if you think about it, that really makes a lot of sense just kind of like, you know, from her experience being traumatized in this, this chicken tractor. Um, and so, you know, she obviously had an emotional experience and this great sense of loss. And the reason that I believe that she was standing next to that sliding glass door was because of the reflection. Um, she didn't have any friends anymore. She didn't have any, you know, a flock. So all that she had left was her reflection in the, in the door. Um, and so when she came to our sanctuary, uh, we tried to, to um, help her beak uh, with a prosthetic beak. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, and it took, you know, weeks for her to, to heal emotionally. Um, you know, at first she just would like sit in our bathroom and, and didn't want to move. Um, but really when we introduced her to some of our other hens um, is when she started to, to come out of her shell. And um, now she's just the sassiest little hen in the world. Um, she's uh, she's an old lady now. <laughs> she's lived a lot longer than most uh, hens um, get to live and uh, with preventative care and, and you know, a, a rich life. Um, she's super happy and her beak, you know, doesn't slow her down at all. She can still eat and drink uh, wonderfully. So, um, so in BB's story that kind of covers the wide range of many problems that um, occur in backyard farms. And I'm not going to try to, to, to mince words. They're, they're farms. Um, people who keep chickens for eggs and for, for flesh, they're, they're farms. They're, just because they're in somebody's backyard, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and so I'm curious, like, it just, you know, obviously don't raise your hand because I can't see you. But 
if you've ever in your vegan advocacy and talking about chickens have, you know, said something to the effect of, well, you know, just please at least don't buy factory farm eggs or don't buy, you know, eggs from battery cage hens, you know, um, and oh, well, you know, backyard, backyard eggs aren't that bad. You know, the, the industrial eggs are really the bad ones. Um, a lot of people, and I know I've done it myself uh, many years ago before I really knew who chickens were, um, we like to try to draw a line between, you know, the really bad stuff, which is the industrial scale farming and cages and sheds and stuff like that, and the small scale so-called humane stuff that happens, you know, in somebody's backyard or a small family farm. Um, you know, we have this kind of internal mental division between those two things, and in reality, they're just you know, parts of the same industry. Um, and in the end, uh, it's not really a matter of scale um, to determine whether or not, uh, you know, what's happening on these farms is, is okay. And so what I want to try to do is try to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've seen and experienced firsthand in over six years of doing um, this rescue work um, to kind of shine a light on what actually happens on backyard farms and to try to help steer everyone away from um, you know, giving a pass to backyard eggs and backyard chicken keeping, um, you know, as less, lesser evil forms of exploitation. So let's start at the beginning. Um, most of which, most of which, when we think about chicken, chicks hatching, you know, we have the images of like babies under their mother's wings and, you know, the, the, uh, the clucking little mama hen on her nest and things like that. Um, but even for backyard chicken keepers, most of the chicks that they get aren't coming from those situations. Um, most of the time they're purchasing them from um, hatcheries uh, and getting them in through the mail or buying them at like a farm supply store where the, the chicks are shipped after hatching. So what you see here is um, eggs that have been incubated in these trays. So those are where the chicks hatch. They don't hatch under a mother, they hatch in a tray in an industrial incubator. Um, and so uh, the chicks are born you know, in these trays, and uh, most of them are sexed shortly after birth, um, which means that when they're first born, there's a, a, a way that, that you can distinguish males from females. It's not 100% reliable, um, but often chicks are sexed and sold as, as sexed chicks. Um, and then uh, within hours of being born, the males are killed um, most of the time. And those who are being shipped out, uh, which, I'm, you know, all of them are, are sent out to farm stores or to homes hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Um, you know, the chicks that you see showing up in, in uh, farm stores, for example, many of them have, still have the little uh, egg tooth on the tip of their beak um, that usually falls off within like a day or, or so for, in most cases. And so they're very young when they're shipped out. Um, but even, you know, as well, sometimes, those, sometimes uh, hatcheries will send baby, baby roosters as packaging material to keep you know, the, the hens cushioned and to keep them warm in colder months. Um, so, whoops. Um, so this is a picture uh, showing eggs, or showing chicks being shipped in the mail in these uh, cardboard containers. Um, and, uh, and this is actually really relevant because during the, all the UPS, or, or sorry, postal service delays due to the pandemic, um, uh, shipments of chip, chicks have been dying because they've been delayed getting to the farms who ordered them. And so as you can see in this, um, this time article, uh, Maine farmers reported that a nearly 5,000 chicks arrived dead after being stuck in mail delays, basically. Um, and this happens all the time. Chicks end up being you know, ill, maimed, disfigured, uh, just in the shipping process. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a horrible industry. And then also, when, again, another relevant reference is um, with the coronavirus, uh, people went, you know, ballistic and, and panic bought chicks from hatcheries and from farm stores, um, thinking that, you know, for, somehow, for some reason it was going to give them food security uh, in the apocalypse. And, you know, many of these homes, people don't know what they're doing. They end up getting roosters. Um, so hatcheries have been selling out while people panic buy chicks. Many of them, you know, who knows what's going to happen to those those chickens? Um, because you know, it's not just like buying a tomato plant. A chick, ch you know, chickens require a lot of care. Um, so, if, so for those who are born on farms and like on backyards or on small farms, um, you know, they do have a little bit more of a natural experience. Um, 
but uh, again, they, they, they go through some of the same problems with um, sexing. Um, some farms will sell unsexed chicks um, to, to consumers. And, you know, so it's kind of like a toss up whether or not you're going to get a rooster or not. Um, and so uh, because roosters don't really start to show signs of sexual maturity, like crowing and um, specific uh, sex specific feathering until, you know, they're a few months old. Um, uh, uh, a lot of times they're, they're, you know, they stay with these people who purchase them from the farms or on the farms where they were born until, you know, lo and behold, they crow for the first time. And then a uh, saying that we, we have around here is once they crow, out they go. Um, and so they're either killed on the farm and usually eaten or they're um, dumped in the woods somewhere um, or they're, you know, taken, sometimes taken to a shelter where they're typically euthanized because nobody wants roosters. Um, and if they live in town, then, then they legally can't keep them anyway. So, and then of course, any of the hens who are born on the farm, they're also kept for eggs. Um, and many are killed after a couple of years once their laying begins to decline. So farmers can replenish their flock um, with, with hens who are gonna lay their maximum amount. Um, hens can continue to lay eggs well into, you know, uh, advanced years, um, but it does start to decline around 18 to 24 months in most, you know, most cases. Oops. Um, so, uh, so this uh, screenshot is from a, a, an organic egg company, which talks about, um, you know, what do farmers do with hens, you know, once their laying declines, and they talk about it. They asphyxiate them, they take them to dumpsters and landfills, um, you know, uh, especially for large scale operations, they use these mass killing methods. For smaller farms, they just, you know, they just chop their heads off um, once they, they don't want them anymore, or they try to sell them as um, like stewing hens or spent hens. Um, and then another atrocious uh, part of, of uh, the industry that we see a lot from backyard farmers are what are called fry pan chicks. Uh, these are typically roosters who are sold, um, you know, at a very young age, and they're meant to be killed and eaten, um, you know, basically like fried in a pan, um, their little bodies. Um, it's, it's, it's horrifying. Another one that, that uh, uh, backyard chicken keepers have, uh, if you ever join any of their groups or, or forums, um, they are, their language is, is just terrifying. Um, and they love to make jokes about killing their chickens and eating their chickens. One of the ones that we encounter a lot is called freezer camp. Um, basically it's sort of like, especially with roosters, like if a rooster gets, you know, gets ornery or, you know, somebody gets a rooster and they don't want them or can't keep them, the rooster's going to go to freezer camp. Um, it's, you know, I guess it's kind of like supposed to be a euphemism for killing and butchering and eating the chickens. It's not really a euphemism because, you know, the imagery is pretty clear what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, like magical thinking with backyard farmers, they're, 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 Backyard farmers are convinced that they're the good guys and that they're doing things, you know, humanely and, um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And so using this term, I imagine, like, solves some, like, you know, psychological uh, dissonance that's going on with the fact that, you know, they're, they're happy little farmers with happy little chickens, but they're also killing them and, and eating them. Um, but yeah, so freezer camp is a popular one that makes me, uh, you know, furious. Um, and then, so... Um, I now want to talk a little bit um, specifically about um, uh, roosters and hens and kind of issues um, relevant to them that we see in backyard uh, chicken flocks. So the vast majority of roosters don't live past sexual maturity. Um, I mentioned it before that most chicks are sexed um, right after they're born. And I, it's really important to emphasize that, that this sexing of chick, chicks is not something that only happens in industrial farms. Um, so the, the stuff about like, you know, people get, see uh, images of like chickens being um, put into macerators or um, suffocated in, in, you know, plastic bags and dumped into to dumpsters. Like all of that happens at, at the hatcheries that supply backyard farmers. Um, there's, there, you know, the only real distinction is that a lot of the, the industrial companies own the hatcheries, like, you know, the hatchery facilities that then supply the, their, the farms that they also own. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, so that sexing process and the killing of male chicks uh, is 100% is, is, is tied into the backyard um, chicken industry. Um, you know, so if you're horrified 
the, the industrial killing of, of chicks on, uh, you know, uh, male chicks, you, you have to understand that that happens for in the backyard uh, uh, egg industry and in backyard farming industry as well. Um, and so uh, those that do, uh, and, and also too, like, again, like once I as I said before, like once they show that they're a rooster, once they become start to, to mature sexually, um, uh, they're usually, they're usually killed or dispatched in some other way. And I'll talk a little bit more about rooster dumping, but like, you know, throwing a rooster into the woods is essentially a death sentence um, for that rooster. Um, so again, they're not going to live much longer than, than sexual maturity. And that's why the vast majority of the roosters that we end up catching who have been dumped in the woods, you know, and, and abandoned are right about that age where they've just started to, to show um, signs of, of being a rooster. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, every, every time uh, almost is, is, is what we see. Um, uh, so those that do live past sexual maturity um, and, and, you know, get to live in the backyard or get to live on the farm, um, they, you know, people usually don't really like them very much. Um, and they also uh, face a number of uh, common health problems. Um, so we see a lot of instances of, of cancer um, and, and some other, other issues um, as roosters get kind of older, um, you know, typically like five to six is a very common age for us to start to see uh, cancer and um, cardiovascular problems in roosters. And so we, you know, you probably have already heard some about kind of all the, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the like health problems that chickens have as a result of egg laying and uh, selective breeding uh, for maximal egg laying. But, you know, roosters come from that same genetic stock. And so their reproductive systems um, are often also kind of, you know, hijacked in their own ways. And so a lot of the health problems that we see are very, very common in, in all breeds of roosters. And they start to kind of happen at the age where hens eat, similarly will kind of have to start to have some serious breakdowns of their reproductive system as they get older. Um, it's kind of like the five to six year old range is, is, is common, um, common um, time frame for that. So no, uh, <clears throat> one other thing also with roosters who do live, you know, past maturity, um, their normal behaviors are usually seen as, as, as a nuisance or as being aggressive um, um, some way. It's basically people misunderstanding who roosters are and their behaviors and labeling them as, as annoying or aggressive. Um, and so, you know, some of those behaviors, crowing, obviously, um, protecting hens from potential threats, which would be humans. Um, so uh, let me just say real quickly, roosters, they're typically seen as aggressive and, you know, fighters and they'll, they'll you know, they'll fight to the death with another rooster. But in reality, um, and we've rescued, you know, hundreds of roosters over the years, um, in reality, roosters are protectors and they're nurturers um, and they're peacekeepers. And so uh, what a rooster does is a rooster monitors, you know, his flock to watch the dynamics of the hens in the flock and, you know, make sure everybody's getting along while also monitoring for external threats, um, you know, potential threats to the flock. And so if a rooster comes to perceive a human as a, a threat um, and not, you know, kind of a safe member of, a member of the flock for lack of red terms, you know, the rooster is going to attack that person because the rooster is defending the hens from this potential threat. And so, you know, people very easily label that as, as aggression when actually what it is, is it's defensive maneuvers um, to protect the hens. Um, because that's one of the primary instincts that roosters have. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really just a, a it's a, it's a, it's a mis misinterpretation of what's going on by the, by the humans. And instead of humans working um, on gaining the trust of the rooster, they usually, you know, fight back or they, they just kill them, send them to freezer camp. Um, but it's a complete misinterpretation and misunderstanding of who roosters are. Um, other roosters that are, other behaviors that are seen as a nuisance in roosters, um, crowing, did I mention? Uh, mating hens, um, like over mating hens sometimes can happen. And so people will see that as like the roosters attacking the hens or something um, when it's often just normal mating behavior when a rooster can kind of have a favorite. And then also crowing, crowing, and uh, kind of one of the biggest ones is not being a hen and therefore not laying eggs. Um, that's, a, that's a cardinal sin amongst backyard egg, you know, farmers. Um, so, and then also uh, it's really important to understand that the um, biases against roosters and the rooster stigma in our culture also happens at like a, 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 um, a regulatory level. So city ordinances in almost every city 
in town that allows backyard chickens um, prohibit roosters um, for uh, because of noise issues. Um, and so here's an example from a town uh, right near us. Um, so this is their their ordinance addressing backyard chickens keep backyard chicken keeping. Um, and under noisy fowl uh, uh, are included roosters, and it's unlawful for people to keep roosters. So, and if you, real quick, if you look at that ordinance above it, uh, backyard chicken keeping, as you can see, there's no, there's no safety protocols, there's no health and sanitary protocols, um, you know, there's no enforcement of this stuff. Uh, you know, backyard chicken keeping is not a regulated industry um, in most cases, and, and even in towns near us that require people to get a permit to keep chickens, one, a lot of people don't get the permit and they still keep them, but two, there's no like inspections or, or you know, kind of um, uh, me measures taken to ensure that people are caring for the chickens within some degree of, of you know, decency and, and safety. Um, and so, and this is kind of the, the case for, for a, lot of, a lot of places that allow backyard chickens, it's kind of a free for all. Um, and then by when, you know, city councils and stuff um, pass backyard chicken ordinances that allow people to back keep chickens, but then also ban people from having roosters, they're, all, they're uh, ultimately creating a situation in, in which thousands and thousands and thousands of roosters are going to be forced into dangerous situations such as being dumped in the woods or sent to a shelter um, or just, you know, killed. Um, and so it's, it's really frustrating because cities and towns, and I've tried, they're not interested in, in, in opening um, up a window for people to keep roosters, even as, as pets, even as like house, you know, house uh, uh, residents. Um, they just, they don't want to deal with it. Um, and, and, you know, neighbors don't want to deal with it. The moment they hear a rooster crowing, they're calling animal control. Um, so it's a really frustrating situation that's baked into the backyard chicken industry in urban and suburban areas um, because they have these laws in place to prohibit people from having roosters, even if they wanted to keep them. And so um, this is a recent example, a very recent example, as in like the last night recent example. Um, we were contacted about this rooster who showed up in, in a woman's yard and had been running around the neighborhood for um, uh, you know a few weeks, and uh, nobody you know nobody knew who he was. Nobody had chickens in the neighborhood, and so um, you know she contacted us. And what often happens when people have a rooster show up in their yard, they really want the rooster to be safe, but they also really don't want to do anything with, about helping the rooster or helping us get the rooster. Um, so you know, and last night my partner uh, Roz drove an hour one way to where the rooster was and managed to catch the rooster. And so he's safe now. Um, the neighborhood was full of very big and loud dogs. You know, he wasn't sleeping anywhere safe. Safe. He was just sleeping out in the open. Um, so he was, you know, uh, likely to get killed by any number of predators that we have in the area. Um, and you know, um, people had been giving him food, but if if nobody's providing them with with formulated food, they're going to be malnourished, um, and they're going to have you know all sorts of um, pathogens and parasites from being um, not cared for properly. Um, you know, chickens are domesticated animals. And so, you know, if you don't live in somewhere like Hawaii, um, they can't survive, uh, you know, well out in, out in the wild. Um, and so, you know, it's not like dumping like a, a wild animal out back and, you know, releasing a wild animal back into, you know, um, the woods and saying, go free. It's like dumping a, a domesticated animal out in an environment that they're not prepared to um, and equipped to survive. Um, but it's a but dumping roosters is kind of a national pastime, and it's all being done by backyard chicken keepers. And it happens so frequently that we um, and other sanctuaries and rescues that handle chickens, we we we're full. We can't keep up with the demand. Um, and meanwhile, with all these roosters being dumped out, you know, in the woods, we're getting emails several times a week, sometimes several times a day, asking us to take in owner surrender roosters, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, another uh, dumped rooster story. Um, this is a group uh, of roosters we call the alchemists. Um, they were named after Renaissance era alchemists because I'm a dork. Um, but uh, they had been dumped. It was a total of nine who had been dumped in a, a neighborhood. It was a golf course neighborhood, million dollar houses. Um, but for some reason, somebody drove into the neighborhood late one night and dumped them. Um, immediately after being dumped, two of them were killed by predators. The other seven, um, over the course of two weeks, I, I went out and rounded them up and um, you know, brought them to live at our sanctuary. And um, 
you know, they, uh, they were very young. They were just at the age of sexual, uh, of, you know, becoming mature, as I, as I said. So it was very clear that like somebody had bred them or bought them and then just didn't want to keep them anymore once, once they were registered. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they, we still have a number of them are still, still with us and they're, you know, part of our rooster flock and, and they're, they're awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, two of their brothers were killed by predators the night that they were dumped. Um, they, again, they don't, they don't survive very long out in the wild in most cases. So, um, I mentioned owners to render roosters. Um, so, so, uh, we get, uh, uh, requests constantly to take roosters, um, from backyard chicken keepers and people who, and, and, and every one of them thinks that they're unique. You know, they love their rooster. They don't want them to go into a stew pot, um, you know, but the, the city where they live, they just can't have roosters. But, you know, you need to understand that, that if you buy or breed chickens, you are always going to end up with roosters and the roosters are always going to be in a position where, where they can't stay or they're not wanted. Um, and this isn't sustainable. The backyard chicken industry is not sustainable um, unless you completely externalize and ignore what happens with roosters. Um, so, you know, if you or someone you know is doing this, is keeping these chickens uh, for, for food, um, and you, they're not prepared to care for any rooster who comes, you know, into their flock, then they shouldn't be doing it. It's, it's irresponsible. Um, and if you live somewhere where you can't keep them, you should know that and you should not be keeping chickens because you very likely at some point will be getting roosters. Um, and so it's ridiculous to think about backyard chicken keeping being some sort of like sustainable practice. It's not. Just look at what happens to the roosters. It's not sustainable and it sure as hell is not ethical. Um, so uh, now in terms of, of hens, um, you know, we like to think about backyard hens as being happy and healthy and running around in, in the grass and having a wonderful life. And it's so much better than their poor, you know, sisters who live in the battery cages and the free range sheds um, on large scale farms. Um, but in reality, because hens are domesticated for egg laying and have been selectively bred to lay eggs um, and are really ultimately uh, primarily wanted for their egg production, um, they face a whole host of problems um, being in backyard chicken flocks. Um, one of the main ones is uh, health related problems that um, come directly from their hyperactive uh, reproductive systems. Um, they've been bred to lay 20 to 30 times as many eggs as their wild ancestors. And that is in no way a natural um, or evolutionarily sensible system. Uh, their bodies break down um, you know, they, by the time a hen is two years old, she is ovulated as many times as a human does um, who is entering menopause. Um, the statistics are just mind, mind blowing. It's also why uh, laying hens are used as a model, a research model for human ovarian cancer because they develop ovarian cancer at such high sp spontaneous um, ovarian cancer at such high rates. Um, so, you know, their, their bodies have been completely hijacked by humans who have uh, messed with their reproductive system and their DNA to make them lay as many eggs as possible. I, I no and so that's why the number one killer of laying hens is, is egg laying. Um, the egg laying that they've been bred to do is going to, most of the time, going to kill them. Um, and so other, all, other health problems that, that come along um, as a consequence of this include osteoporosis, malnutrition, um, and internal parasites that can end up killing them a lot of times because their immune systems are so compromised from um, you know, being um, biologically, uh, you know, uh, hijacked. And also because uh, chickens are prey animals, they hide illnesses really well until they just, they just can't anymore. Um, and so at, at, at the point that a chicken shows you she's ill, it's often too late to, to do anything about it. Um, you know, in many cases, by the time they show these symptoms very clearly, it's gone on for so long that it may be too far, um, you know, for them to be healed. And not all the time, but, but sometimes it, it, that's the case. Um, and so when, and so that's really important because when people say, oh, my, ha my hens are so happy and healthy in my backyard, most of the time they're taking time bombs who um, either are or, or will be walking around with some major devastating health problem that the, the farmer isn't even gonna know. One day they'll just find the chicken dead and say, oh, well, you know, the chicken died. Um, so, you know, but, but it's, such a common problem that, that you know, backyard chicken breeds uh, are, are prone to these things as well. Justin. Um, yeah. 
can, it's hope. Um, can you mute Karen? Karen, you need to mute yourself. We can hear. Her. Okay, she's muted. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay, so um, uh, I wanted to tell another story about a, a rescued hen. Um, uh, her name was Beatrice. Uh, she came to live with us in, in summer of 2014. Um, she's a very common uh, backyard breed um, and she's kind of one of the higher end layers. Um, uh, uh, like all the kind of red hens are, are, are uh, you know, usually lay, lay, lay lots of eggs. Um, and so, um, sorry. So in um, May of 2015, we started to notice that she wasn't feeling well um, and this was after she had already show, had an issue with, um, with a, a, a reproductive problem, um, you know, later in the year after we rescued her. So in May 2015, we found that she had um, uh, had a swollen abdomen and, you know, um, looked like she had some reproductive problem going on. So we went to our vet, found her abdomen filled with fluid, um, which is a common uh, uh, symptom of egg yolk peritonitis um, that can, is, you know, almost the number one, or usually the number one killer for like backyard hens. And her bones were so uh, worn down from egg laying that our vet said, we really shouldn't pick her up if we can avoid it. Um, that's how, how fragile her bones were after, after um, so much egg laying. So we treated her with medications. Um, we, we did some preventative care to help um, stop uh, egg laying for her to give her body a break. Um, and she recovered beautifully. Um, it was amazing. I mean, she looked like a brand new hen after, after um, you know, she recovered from this initial illness. And so she was just the picture of health. She was the alpha hen for the flock. Um, so she bossed everybody around and you know, called the shots. Um, and then in July 27, or and then in 2017, in the in, um, summer, she started to, um, again, show some signs like she wasn't feeling very well. Um, and unfortunately, she did pass away. Um, and I took this picture um, when we were doing the, the autopsy on her after she had died at our vets. And what you're seeing um, there in the middle of the table and kind of around it is cooked egg material. Um, so when an, what an impaction is when egg material gets stuck in the oviduct and because their body temperatures are over 100 degrees, that egg material just cooks over time. Um, and so it turns into basically, you know, if you had eggs for breakfast, you're eating that. That's exactly what you're eating. Um, and you can see also another, another um, egg uh, kind of below that big mass, but that you know, mass was almost the size of like a baseball. And our vet said that she had probably been carrying that around for like three plus years. She had probably developed that before she even came to our sanctuary. Um, so she had lived for many years with this big mass inside of her and she looked, she looked perfect. You know, the only time that we knew something was wrong was when she started to act like she was sick. And by that point, the, the um, impaction had started to abscess and to cause an infection um, that eventually killed her. So I, I tell that story just because, um, you know, this is what happens so often in hens who aren't, um, you know, given any medical treatment in backyards. And because they're prone to um, reproductive problems so frequently, you know, this happens in backyards. And it's not just in, you know, the hens who are inside battery cages. And the, the quote I have put up here is from um, an industry article talking about how egg laying is, you know, related issues are the number one causes of mortality in laying hens. This is not, you know, vegan argument. This is from an industry um, article. And that bowl of stuff that you see there is, again, from another hen who died with um, her abdomen full of cooked egg material. Um, it kills them, um, you know, and these things happen all the time. So um, then along with the kind of like sex specific um, issues that I've been talking about with hens and roosters, um, there are also some other common, very common problems with backyard chicken flocks that um, result in untold numbers of deaths and, and injuries um, and you know, all untold amounts of suffering um, in these hens, or sorry, in these, in these chickens. Um, so one of the main ones is, is inadequate medical care. Um, so I've talked a little bit about kind of some of the health problems that you typically see in, um, in backyard chickens and that we deal with all the time, um, uh, keep, you know, who are caring for these chickens. Um, and so, I mean, I've seen it, you know, from in every, every manifestation you can think of, of, of all the stuff that, that chickens go through um, uh, on these backyard farms and then, you know, aren't being treated for. Um, and so, um, 
chickens are still considered farm animals by, by many vets and of course by many people because they're kept primarily for food. Um, but in truth, they need very specialized care from, from avian veterinarians and specialists with experience in treating birds. Um, because as birds, they're very different from the mammals who are, you know, kind of the high, um, high value uh, uh, animals on farms. And so, you know, your horse vet shouldn't be the primary medical caregiver for your chickens. Um, if you, you know, chickens who don't have access to, to, to specialized knowledge um, and experienced avian care oftentimes aren't going to get adequate care and are going to, you know, are going to die from, from these very common health problems. Um, and as I mentioned in the other slide, chickens hide illness. So it takes a very well-trained eye and a rigorous health um, exam schedule to catch problems early on. Um, once they've, begin, they've been left to escalate and to simmer, um, it, can, it can often be too late, even if people do try to get medical care. And, and again, many of them don't. Um, many of them um, are perfectly fine to leave chickens to, to die um, without any sort of intervention or, or you know, kind of uh, uh, ways to ease their suffering. Um, but even if some, some people do, who do try, a lot of times it's, they're too far gone to really do a whole lot. Um, and again, that's just because people get chickens and don't put the time and energy needed into understanding them and being able to, to know how to care for them um, with their, their medical needs. Um, and so along with, with the, the care knowledge is also recognizing the importance of preventative treatment. Um, and that can include everything from contraceptives to help um, avoid reproductive problems to, you know, giving proper um, regimens of, of parasite control um, and, and different things like that. And, you know, if you've spent $5 on a, on a chicken, why would you spend hundreds of dollars on medical care and on preventative care, um, you know, if really all you want is just, just whatever eggs that hen lays? Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any financial sense. And just kind of on a, on a values level, most people really don't care about chickens. Um, they're seen as kind of like the, the least interesting and, and least valuable animals on the planet in a lot of cases. Um, so people aren't going to invest the time and money um, and resources and to give them the proper care that they need. Um, but you know, they're very expensive to care for and they require intensive amounts of, of, of you know, kind of caregiving to make sure that they stay healthy and get what they need. Um, but again, backyard chicken keepers just, they don't want to do that um, because it's just, it's just not worth it for them and, and they don't take them seriously. A another huge one is inadequate predator protection. Um, so chickens are frequently attacked, um, maimed, and killed by common daytime and nighttime predators. And it really varies depending on your region, what predators you're going to have to deal with. Um, but one of the most common topics of conversation amongst, um, you know, vegan chicken caregivers is predator protection and how to deal with, you know, threats from predators. Um, and, uh, you know, we feel very strongly that, you know, in addition to giving chickens a sense of like freedom and the ability to, to um, engage in their natural instinctual behavior, we also have to keep them safe um, because humans are the reason they're here and uh, predators can very easily get chickens, um, you know, who aren't protected properly. And so if chickens aren't giving, being given proper predator protection, I think it's, it's, it's a form of violence. Um, and, you know, and it's a, it's, it's a harm being done to them because they're not going to, to survive predator attacks um, in many cases. And there are so many predators out there who, um, you know, will kill chickens um, that, that, it needs to be taken very seriously and, ch and chicken caregivers or, you know, back or chicken farmers don't um, because they're seen as expendable and it's not worth the, the money to, to, to do it. Um, so, you know, that, that, that image of, 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 of happy hens free ranging in a backyard, um, it's actually quite, quite sinister because um, being left um, to, super, to free range without supervision and without predator protection can leave them open to predator attacks, whether it's a dog, getting into the yard or jumping a fence um, or, you know, a hawk attacking from, from above. Um, all sorts of predators uh, are, are around during the day and the night. Um, and so if they're not ca cared for properly and kept in a safe area, um, they're very likely going to be, be attacked by a predator. Um, and so doing proper predator protection costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, up front before you even think about how much it costs to care for the chickens. Um, you know, just tossing a, a bunch of chickens into a backyard is not safe. 
and most of the the so-called coops that um, backyard chicken farmers use to contain their chickens also aren't aren't safe you know a raccoon can can tear through chicken wire easily um you know foxes and coyotes can can tear through these these um you know dinky uh, uh coops and stuff very easily raccoons have the dexterity of a toddler they can open locks and latches um very easily and so if people aren't researching what are the the best practices for predator protection they're just leaving their their flock open to being attacked just like bb was again bb was in one of these really rinky dink chicken tractors and the raccoon got in easily and you see and the result was you know bb being uh, attacked and, and her sisters being killed so when that that predator attack eventually happens um the the chickens are usually left to suffer without proper medical care um and you know they sometimes they die sometimes they survive um, but oftentimes they're injured for life um you know that can be physical physical you know uh damage or it can be even emotional um and so a couple of examples from our experience and again like i i mean i could i could pull out hundreds of examples that, that we've dealt with, you know, personally, but um, Brona was attacked by, by a predator, a, a, I believe it was a fox, who, um, you know, really did some serious damage to her head. And um, after she was attacked, the, the, the people who had her left her in a bathtub for, for a, like a week. And then once she was kind of like stabilized a little bit, they put her back out with the flock and she was attacked by the other chickens. Um, and so she spent, she went without medical care and was basically just kind of left alone in a bathtub um, before they finally contacted us and surrendered her to, to us. And her entire, you know, her entire, she had been almost scalped. Her head was covered in scabs. Um, we didn't know if her eyes were even going to work still because they were just covered over with scabs. Um, here she is after when she, the day when she finally opened one of her eyes. Um, and she also had some um, vestibular damage, some damage to her, like her, um, you know, eardrums and her ear canals. And so for months, she was upside down. She, her orientation was all off. And so she had her head turned kind of upside down. Um, and she, you know, managed to get her to eat and drink and stuff like that. But she looked like, you know, she was upside down chicken. Um, but she finally healed again after months and months and months of care. Um, and she, you know, was very healthy and happy until, you know, she passed away, unfortunately, last year. Um, but, uh, you know, again, like she was attacked and left without treatment for a very long time and she wouldn't have gotten treatment if she had not been surrendered to us. Um, she was an amazing hen. You know, it's, it's unbelievable what she, what she lived through, but she was such an amazing hen. Um, another, another example, um, is the most perfect hen in existence who is Althea. Um, she's a blind, uh, hen who lives inside with us, um, because she's, blind and she really likes to be, be by herself most of the time. Um, but uh, she was uh, being kept at a Montessori school as part of a flock of chickens, um, you know, for the, the kids to educate themselves with. And um, again, you know, story old as time, uh, they didn't have them in a proper uh, enclosure and one night a predator got in, killed all the other chickens and then um, blinded Althea. Um, and instead of taking her to the vet, they brought her inside and the kids were feeding her yogurt from pipettes for several days. Um, and, you know, one of the teachers at the school apparently also kept chickens and so was an expert and was, you know, obviously like telling everybody the best way to, to, to deal with her. Um, so they were giving her yogurt from pipettes. Uh, when they contacted us, they didn't want to surrender her to me. It was a Friday evening when, when I, we got the, um, the, the email and I basically had to like really hard, like do some hard negotiating for, for, to get them to release her to us that night, um, to make sure that she was safe and getting care because they wanted, they didn't want the kids to not see her when she came in on Monday. Um, and so, I mean, it was a ridiculous situation. Um, you know, she was in desperate need of medical care and proper, proper nutrition. Um, but, you know, the kids, you know, the kids didn't, you know, we couldn't let the kids not see her on Monday. So, but we did get her, I got her that night and we began to care for her. And so she's been with us for uh, several years, very happy and healthy. And, and she's just, she's just amazing. Um, so uh, to kind of sum up on a more, um, 
like, you know, philosophical level as well, just there's no such thing as an ethical egg. It doesn't matter where it came from, who the hen was, who the, the humans were, who were the farmers. There's no such thing as an ethical egg for human consumption. Eggs belong to hens, not to humans. Um, they can't consent, consent to us taking them. They don't and they can't give them to us. And their bodies have been so manipulated through millennia of selective breeding that they can't even stop, even if it kills them. So there are so many reasons not to, not to eat eggs. Um, where the hens live uh, isn't one of them. Um, that's not what matters when we, th we think about the ethics of egg consumption. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just want to really drive home, whether it's in a backyard, in an industrial shed, or a battery cage, their eggs are not ours to use. And I also want to make sure that every time you have a conversation with someone about their happy hens who give them eggs, ask the question, where are their brothers? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. That was incredible. And so on time, man, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. And so I think this is where we are going to take a little break. It's going to be really probably our only break uh, for the day. So if you want to go grab something to eat, a little something to drink or whatever you need to do, now is the time. Uh, we'll take a little break. If, if people have questions for Justin, maybe Justin could stick around for just a minute to see, ask, answer questions in the, in the, in the chat maybe. But I don't want to put that kind of, you know, if you need a break too, Justin, 